This is Café Scientifique, brought to you by Simon Fraser University, the Faculty of Science. My name is Cynthia Hansen, and I work at the Dean of Science office, and we hold this discussion series at least six or seven times a year, usually three or four in the spring and another three in the fall term. So this is the our third one for this year. And we're happy that we're doing this with you all today. We're still doing it virtually, unfortunately, but hopefully um, sometime soon we can revert back to in-person. We used to do this in person pre-COVID times, but we're staying virtual for now. And we're happy that you're all able to join us today. Um, this is a discussion series that really presents different faculty members from across our eight science departments. And we try to feature a different presenter each time. And the purpose of which is really to help you engage with our faculty members on various research topics that they might have and, or might be interested in. And it allows you to ask questions and engage with our faculty members. After today's event, we will be sending out a feedback web survey link we would love to hear from you and to help us improve on this series as we move forward with more events. Again, as I'm so happy to see lots of familiar names on the attendee list. And to all those who are joining us for the first time, we do have some registrants coming from beyond BC. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see lots of our community partners be involved in this discussion series. So let me begin with a uh, land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're privileged to gather today on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Kwikwetlam, and Musqueam peoples. We thank them for having cared for these lands and waters since time out of mind and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. If you know whose territory you're currently on, please take a moment to reflect on this. And if you don't know whose land you're on, I encourage you to look it up and make yourself familiar with the uh, indigenous peoples whose land you occupy. So, before we go on and introduce our speaker for tonight, let me begin by just going through a few house rules we have for this webinar. First off is there is a Q&A box that you should be seeing on your screen. I encourage everyone to type in their questions or comments that you might have for our speaker using that Q&A box. We will try our best to read everyone's questions and comments after the uh, presentation. Also, you may have noticed that chat page is turned off and this is for just to keep the webinar simple and focused. So we encourage you to use the Q&A box for questions and comments. There's also, I I think the live transcript has been turned on for your convenience. You have that option of showing the subtitles if that helps you. So um, that's put there for your convenience. And last uh, reminder, we are recording this session and we will be sharing the link on our website for all who would want to review the uh, session tonight or would like to share it with colleagues and friends after tonight's event. Okay. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. We have someone from our Department of Physics at SFU. He's an assistant professor and Canada Research Chair Tier 2. His research interests, oh, quite a lot. He has been interested in doing work on subatomic particle physics, astroparticle physics, and neutrino physics, and he has come to us from schools from Canterbury, Munich, and Stockholm, and now he's with us, fortunately, at Simon Fraser University. His presentation title for tonight is From the South Pole to the Edge of the Universe and Back to the Coast of British Columbia. And he had said he had wanted to talk to us about what really is a neutrino and what is neutrino astronomy and all about 
how can British Columbia play a dominant role for neutrino astronomy in the near future? So I'd like to give the floor over to our presenter for tonight, Dr. Matthias Danninger. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you very much. Let me start sharing. All right, I think. Could you confirm that you see it? Yes, we yep. can see your slides, yes. Excellent, so thank mm -hmm. you very much for the introduction. Um, I actually never answered you if, if I'm happy to be interrupted. Um, if there is a pressing question, feel free to just stop me. Um, I might actually answer the question anyways during the talk, so maybe people can yeah. also keep them for afterwards, but I'm happy to, to do either way. All right, yeah. so um, let me get started. It's a quite long title, kind of almost um, too big to capture, and I hope I can uh, give it some meaning to um, in the next, let's say, 40 minutes or so. So I wanted to start um, a little bit who I am which also might be interesting to people because maybe also when I was in high school or started to study physics, um, I, I did not think that physics might be something where you can actually be quite uh, an explorer and it can be quite exciting and you can do quite a few things. So maybe this is also of interesting uh, nature for some of you to see really what's, what, what you can do when you do, for example, particle physics or also other fields of research and physics. So I graduated, so I'm originally from Munich. Um, so I graduated from the Technical University of Munich. And actually something which I didn't put in here is um, I went to New Zealand for actually in total three years for some exchange years. And that's where I got in touch with the ice cube experiment, which I will tell you more about. And you can see some pictures here from the South Pole. Um, so the ice cube is at the South Pole, which you will learn more and, and some sort of hero action shots of actually building the, the detector here. And so this is a bit of a younger self from me. And, um, and I'm also hiding somewhere back here, but um, um, yeah, so, so you will learn more about this. After um, that, I actually continued to work on IceCube and um, did my PhD at Stockholm University in Sweden. And then I changed a little bit the field within particle physics and joined the Atlas experiment when I came to, um, to BC. And uh, I was a postdoctoral fellow at UBC. I will talk a little bit, mention sort of briefly the Atlas experiment, but, but not much. And then I joined, um, as was already alluded to, um, the Faculty of um, Science here as a, at SFU in 2019. So I, I couldn't resist. So as every good polar explorer, I don't know how familiar you are with polar exploration, but possibly you heard of Shackleton. And um, it is just too nice of, of, a, of a coincidence that uh, this is a picture of the endurance as taken um, during the Shackleton expedition on the left. And then the ship sank, if some of you might know. And just, I think, two weeks ago, or, or not even two weeks ago, um, it was actually rediscovered. And um, here are some images from several thousand meters deep, I think. I actually forgot it. Uh, but here is a, a picture of the endurance, how it is now on the, on the ground. So. As every good um, uh, polar explorer, so also went I on a ship. And um, this is something, you know, you wouldn't believe it, what you can do as a particle physicist. So um, it turns out that uh, the US who runs most, or the stations where I had to work with, um, uh, called on a Swedish icebreaker for a very long time. So I actually took a journey on this uh, icebreaker, the Odin here, which you see. Um, and took from Gothenburg here, the boat for a very long run down to South America and then here around Antarctica to the McMurdo station, which is the largest station run by, by the US Antarctic program from where you eventually fly to the South Pole. And actually I took it back also here to, to Punta Arenas and again back in South America. And it was uh, quite exciting. We actually had some particle physics in this little container here, but um, I, I, I can tell you it was probably not the most successful experiment I was part of, but they needed a PhD student to run experiments. So you can do very exciting things as a particle physicist. So today what I do is um, I work a lot with the uh, Atlas experiment where you see some images. It's a huge detector. You see an, uh, a little person standing here or for example here. Um, possibly some of you have heard it or most of you have heard it, of course, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, I, I work a lot with this, but I, I don't wanna talk about what, what I do with this experiment today. 
Um, I want to rather span the arc, as I said, from my time uh, during my PhD and work on IceCube um, and come now to, to something which is called here P1, which is the Pacific Ocean Neutrino um, Experiment or Explorer, as we want to call it, um, which we want to build here in, in the, off the coast of BC. So skipping now back to the actual talk, um, let's get started. So what I wanted to to somehow that you have a takeaway message um, at the end of tonight. I hope that I can somewhat tell you, and the neutrino is a highly interesting particle, and I will tell you only one aspect, and this is really related to uh, neutrino astronomy more or less, but a little bit what is a neutrino and why it is so crucially important. Um, why are neutrinos actually special? Again, a bit in the light of neutrino astronomy. They have also very, very special for the particle physics part, but I don't wanna to talk too much about that today. Then how can we detect them? Because you will learn that because they are so special, they really don't want to be detected. And then at the end, hopefully you get a good idea, why do we want to detect them here in BC? And um, with this, I wanna start more or less with a question, what is our everyday world made of? And this is something you learn in high school. And probably you're told, oh yeah, okay, so um, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. This is uh, usually what forms together um, atoms and the atoms bundle together to, to literally all objects you know as everyday in, in your everyday life. Huh? So whether this is um, organic matter or humans who play ice hockey, or here an image of everything we actually built and have around us um, in, in Vancouver here, of course, it's an image. Huh? So of course, the question, which I wouldn't ask you this if, it, um, if, if the answer wouldn't be no, is the whole universe really made out of only protons, neutrons, and electrons? And the question is, of course, no, it is not. So let me take a little excursion. Also, what I teach when I teach um, first year mechanics at, at SFU here. And this is one of the examples I, I, I still do. And um, so the question is, what is wrong in this picture? So what you see here, we have here a neutron and we have a proton. Hopefully um, these are terms which you are roughly familiar with. And the neutron and the proton actually can switch back and forth in nuclear reactions. You might've heard that. Um, so the neutron can decay into a proton and an electron or you can actually create a neutron if you have a proton or an electron. Yeah? So they can literally switch their identity back and forth in nuclear reactions. But there's something wrong in this picture. So if you have a, this decay, let's just focus on the neutron with decay to a proton and an electron. So momentum conservation and also energy conservation will tell you these two things would literally fly apart like this. There are only two, two sort of uh, daughter particles from one particle which decays, they have to fly back to back. So when Alison Mott in 1933 um, did experiments on this, they realized that this is not true. So when they observed the, the, the particles, they saw that these particles by no means are flying back to back away. Uh, so they could actually find that they're totally different angular dependencies and they could detect these proton and the electrons sometimes even close together. And what they couldn't detect at the time was the neutrino, which is also part of this nuclear reaction. And the neutrino is the particle which really makes these um, nuclear reactions possible. So if a neutron decays, it not only decays into a proton and electron, but it also emits or decays into a neutrino. And this neutrino could not be detected for a very long time. So what it was found in this experiment, it was measured as missing energy. And this is actually still today an extremely common technique, how we try to find new particles. For example, at the Large Hadron Collider, if we try to find new particles, which we can't detect, which our detector can't detect, we try to um, understand everything that is created in that particle, and then try to find this imbalance which at that time was the neutrino. Uh, and nowadays we try to find other particles uh, which, which would create this missing transverse energy. So already in 1930, um, actually Pauli um, made a, or, or 
theoretically postulated this particle. And at that time, he essentially already coined a very famous sentence, at least in particle physics or neutrino physics, which is said, he said, I've done a very terrible thing. I have invented a particle that cannot be detected. And that speaks already a little bit to the nature of the neutrino because it is extremely difficult to detect and it really doesn't want to interact with matter very much. It's very, what we call weakly interactive. But I will talk more about this. So to go back to our question, is the whole universe made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons? We know the answer now is no. And actually these are extreme rarities. So for every one of a proton neutron, for one of these, the universe contains more than a billion of neutrinos. So the most abundant particle we have, they are neutrinos. So the fact that we are literally not faced by them tells you already they fly through us all the time and essentially we have no notice of this. So what can create neutrinos? We will look of course more into this, but these are just a few of the sources. And as I said, neutrinos are traces of nuclear reactions. So wherever you have a nuclear reaction, you can create or neutrinos are emitted. So of course, one of the most um, easy um, things we can name straight away, if I talk nuclear reactions, we will see that in nuclear reactors, we produce a lot of neutrinos. Also, please note, maybe you're familiar with this, this light blue glimmer of a, nutri a, nu a nuclear reactor. I will come back to this as well during the talk. The Earth has a lot of nuclear reactions, especially within the core. So the Earth itself emits a lot of neutrinos. One very interesting source of neutrinos is the Big Bang itself. So how everything in the universe began. So a lot of neutrinos got created, actually so many that within a square centimeter in everywhere where you are, you would have around 200 of them at any time. And if you could make an experiment who would detect these neutrinos, you would go straight to get a Nobel Prize in Stockholm because this would be a big deal. So maybe you can think about something. Of course, something which I will be very interested in throughout this talk is something uh, of a very high energy phenomena, for example, exploding stars, um, uh, merging neutron stars, uh, like phenomena in, in astrophysics. The sun is probably the brightest source we have very close by. So the sun emits per second around 100 trillion neutrinos. So it's a huge number. Of course, we have learned by now to produce neutrinos also in accelerators on Earth. Um, I will talk a little bit about the energies we can produce there compared to what the, the nature can do. And even our, our body ourselves, if you look at this number, is very huge. So we can emit, or we do emit around 340 million neutrinos a day. And that is most, most comes from um, salt and salt has some radioactive um, small isotopes, so small abundance of isotopes. And when these decay, they are nuclear reactions and they emit neutrinos. So for example, if you wanna be very neutrino rich for a day, you should eat a lot of bananas because the bananas have lots of potassium and then you become a high source of neutrinos for a few hours or a day if you eat them. Okay, so let me have an analogy why I'm interested in neutrinos for astrophysics. And the easiest, what I could think of is if I take our hand. Um, so what I can see in my hand, I look at it, you know, and of course, if I hurt myself, let's say I like mountain biking, you know, I, I fall sometimes reasonably often. So if I hurt my hand and I can't see directly, of course, what's going on. So I go to the doctor and luckily by now, we have quite a few means to us to understand what's going on. And every time the doctor has a different tool to look at my hand, he can learn something new. So on the left, of course, we have an X-ray. So if I broke a bone, he can identify in the X-ray picture that um, a bone is broken. If he has an MRI image, he can look if I tore some ligaments or have some soft tissue injury. Uh, so he learns something else because it looks in a different wavelength. And also, I mean, the picture on the right, we probably don't need this so much at the doctor. This would be an infrared picture. So this shows you um, where the hand is the hottest. So this is where you have the most blood vessels. Vessels there, obviously, at your fingertips. So the analogy really is here. Whenever you look at an object with a different means, 
you will really learn something crucial about it in a very different way. And we want to do exactly the same to look at exploding stars and see what we can learn from there. So I take the example of the Crab Nebula, which was actually the last um, supernova, which we, we sort of could see by naked eye um, a good thousand years ago, where a star ran out of fuel and it exploded. And our days, we see the remnants of this in the so-called Crab Nebula. And now I take the same analogy to astronomy. So if I go here from the observation on the top left, which is the observation in radio. So all of this is electromagnetic spectrum. So essentially photons. Radio is the least energetic. And then when I follow down, as we read a book, down to gamma rays, these are the most high energetic sources of photons here. So if I look in, the, um, in radio, for example, these red spots here, they are emissions from something what we call synchrotron radiation. And this is when highly relativistic particles essentially spin in very strong magnetic fields, which are around in these areas. So you can see essentially trace the very high um, magnetic fields within this cloud of particles uh, or this explosion remnant shells. Quite nice, of course, if you look here, this is from Hubble, the picture, you can really see kind of the exploding image, all the shells, the parts which flew apart, uh, the matter. The probably most interesting thing, which you cannot see in any of the other ones, is in X-rays. So this is quite high energy photons. You can see a very kind of spinning disk. Yeah? And you can really see a core, which is the neutron star at the center. And the spinning disk, what we call the accretion disk, accretes the matter into the neutron star and then blows it out in jets, kind of in, in this direction here, one here and one here. So this is something you absolutely cannot resolve in the images before. And then if you go to the gamma rays itself, you see the emission purely from the core, from the center of it, which is the neutron star at the center. So every time you look at it, you really can learn something new. So the question is, nothing of this can look inside of the star because nothing traces nuclear reactions like neutrinos do. So the key is that we want to look now how this looks like in neutrinos. Um, Okay, so how do we actually accelerate or create neutrinos in these objects? Um, it's actually really the same what, we, what the, the universe can do or nature can do than what we do here on Earth. Um, so we need big magnetic fields. Uh, and these magnetic fields are kind of done in particle accelerators. And these are usually fueled in our picture by something what we call supermassive black holes, collapsing stars onto a neutron star. So these are our accelerators, uh, which are powered by humongous amount of gravitational energy. Yeah. On Earth, we actually build accelerators, for example, where we accelerate protons, like here in Fermilab or close to uh, in, in Vancouver, we have Triumph where we have accelerators. So we accelerate these particles, in this case here, how we create neutrinos, we have protons, and then what we call a beam dump experiment. We dump the beam of protons into a huge target. Um, so here, in this target, we have a magnetic field. It's very dense and compact and everything gets absorbed or some charged particles within magnetic fields get deviated from the line. The only particles which continue to fly out are neutrinos which are created in this beam dump in this decay of particles which are created right here. Because neutrinos are not held up by matter, they fly through literally everything and they continue to fly in a straight line. So this is exactly how we on earth create neutrino beams. And nature does exactly the same. So we have accelerators which are powered by gravitational energy and they essentially create a beam dump experiment by dumping this accelerated protons or charged particles into a nearby radiation, which is around the star. And this creates neutrinos in nature as well. So it's really the same, same. So now we can say, okay, why don't you just do this experiment here on earth? And why do we wanna look into, into stars? Can we not understand the same? So here's maybe my kind of spin to my other experiment at the LHC. So here would be Atlas. So you see a, an aerial view of uh, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, 
which is um, at CERN um, near Geneva. And you can see it's a huge 27 kilometer accelerator. Yeah. And if we take, I don't want to talk too many details about this, but this is our most powerful accelerator we have on Earth. If I take the same magnets, like these LHC magnets, which is more or less the state of the art what we can do on Earth, and I line them up in space, yeah, take the same magnets, and then I have to build an accelerator of the size of the orbit of Mercury in order to reach the energies nature can reach, which is of course impossible because you cannot line up magnets you know, around some orbit in space. So this is the reason why we cannot recreate exactly the same experiments because nature is so much more powerful than what we can do on Earth. That's why we want to study what is happening in the universe in these objects. Another reason why neutrinos are so important or so interesting to study is A, I told you they are traces of nuclear reactions. So these are the only particles which can really tell us what's going on inside because everything else doesn't look really inside what's going on into the reactions. But it's also the only messenger which comes directly to us from Earth. So if I take this example here, so if I take charged particles like protons, what we usually call cosmic rays, we have a lot of magnetic fields around extra galactic, galactic, we have magnetic fields everywhere. So if you put charged particles through a magnetic field, you can see they would follow some arbitrary trajectory. And when you observe these charged particles on Earth, you can actually not tell where they came from. They could come from somewhere totally different. You cannot relate this observation to the emission from here. If we take photons, photons are a bit different. So photons travel in a, in a straight line, but they get absorbed. So if they hit some interstellar material or clouds or other photons, they get alternated, they get absorbed, they get re-emitted, but the energy changes. So they also don't essentially carry the same amount of information as they initially did. So when we observe the Earth, it's not the same photon that was emitted from this source we are interested in. But the neutrino is the only particle which literally flies through everything. So if we can detect it, then we can really be certain it came from that source. So in other words, what we call the neutrino is really a perfect astrophysical messenger. So it has no electric charge. So magnetic fields don't deviate it. It is essentially massless. So it interacts very little. It is essentially unabsorbed and it tracks nuclear processes. So we can really look into it. What makes it so excellent as a messenger is of course also the downside. It is so extremely difficult to detect. So one last aspect, this plot is maybe a little bit, or well, this diagram, let's, let's phrase it that way, is a little bit complicated, but I, I hope I can um, convince you from another aspect, which is really, really interesting. So here we see on this, on this one axis, we see a distance. The distance is in megaparsec. Uh, so if you don't know about this, it's, it's a unit which is very large. Maybe it helps the galactic center would be here, the nearest next galaxy would be around one megaparsec. These would be the nearest blazars. And if you go to cosmological distances, you can see we go very far away. Here we have the energy, the energy in a funny unit, if you're not a particle physics, we, physicist, we call it a electron volt. Maybe to put it in perspective, I can tell you where the Large Hadron Collider would be. So we have 13 TeV, TeV is 10 to the 12th. So 13 would probably put the LHC around here. So this would be the energy, what the LHC can create. Um, so we can make observations if we, if we look at, as we said, optical X-rays, gamma rays for a large portion of the sky. But we come to 20% here, which is this black area, 20% of the universe. So in this distance over energy area, which is completely opaque. Uh, so only neutrinos can essentially um, look into 20% of the universe. And that's a very interesting aspect because we have never been able to look into these 20% of the universe and there might be big surprises waiting for us. Okay, so now we want to change gear and we want to actually uh, look how can we detect them. So obviously they're challenging. So if we have a wish list, you need a very large detector. Water is good. 
ice is also good. You need to provide a very clear medium so that the light can be detected, which I will explain in a second. And it's also nice if you somewhat shield yourself from external events like cosmic rays because they are large backgrounds. So usually we go somewhere, try to go a bit deep, let's say deep into the ice or deep into the ocean. So let me tell you how we actually detect neutrinos. Neutrinos really don't like to interact. That's why we need a large detector. Otherwise, you wait for a very, very long time. So if a neutrino comes in, it can occasionally interact with the nuclei or the atom of the, let's say, the medium you are in, whether this is water or ice, for example. In this interaction, we are talking here about very high energy neutrinos. It can create what we call a muon. This muon is a heavy brother or cousin, if you want to call it, of the electron. It's very similar. Right? And when this muon flies through the ice, it emits something what we called Cherenkov radiation, so which is blue light. And this blue light, we are trying to detect with a lattice of essentially very sensitive light cameras, which we deploy either in water or in ice. Um, to give you a little bit of a feel, so this blue light is exactly the same blue light, why nuclear reactors glim blue. So I sort of remember the image of the nuclear reactor, it's kind of dimming, glimming blue. And this is exactly because we have nuclear reactions we have lots of neutrinos, they interact, they create muons, also electrons, and these particles emit this so-called Cherenkov radiation, which is a very blue characteristic light. And this is why they glim blue. So we can use this to also reconstruct the path of the muon. And how do we do this? This is because the muon travels kind of faster than the speed of light in water or ice, so it travels kind of supersonic if I take the analogy to an airplane. So if you have here an airplane which is stopped and it has its engine running, you could easily locate it uh, because the sound waves would go out. If it travels subsonic, you can see how the pressure waves of the sound or the sound waves, how they would, would travel. If you're right at the speed of sound, it is trying to break through the sound barrier. But if you go supersonic, you don't even have to know where the plane is. You just have to detect the so-called very straight wave front on each side. And you can, without seeing the plane itself, you can tell where the plane is. And this is exactly the technique we are using to reconstruct the direction of this muon. And because the interaction is so high energy, we can infer from this exactly the direction where the neutrino came from. And this is how we detect these high energy neutrinos. All right, so coming to IceCube to actually show you a little bit of a detector. So IceCube is at the South Pole. You really want a large body of frozen water, uh, which is ice in this case. And the South Pole sits essentially on three kilo kilometers of ultra pure ice or ultra pure and ultra transparent ice. So here is the South Pole station. If you ever have the pleasure to travel there, you travel on such a plane with skis, you will land here. And here you can see already the footprint of Ice Cube, which is kind of a hexagonal footprint. And it's one square kilometer kind of a footprint. And this is how huge the detector is. So I show you in a little bit of a, a video here, which is quite nice how we built this detector. So first of all, you have to drill through the fern, which is 60 meters of essentially compact icy snow, but it's still quite loose. And then afterwards, you come with a very sort of interesting and custom hot water drill system, which is essentially a nozzle, which sprays in very high pressure, very hot water out. And you melt your way almost three kilometers down into the ice. So here's how this really looks. Everything is, is kind of like a, like a circus on, on skis. So you have a own hot water plant, which is like a four and a half megawatt plant. You have to create a lot of water, you know, very hot. And then to each borehole, you essentially bring the, bore, the rig, which you can see here, everything is on skis. This is the hose. 
which the hot water will be pushed through. This is again an image of the of the plant. Everything has to be shipped down there. So this creates the high pressure of the hot water, which then pushes it through the holes. You will see it in a second. So this is quite an endeavor. And here you can see how the hot water drill essentially comes out of the borehole at the South Pole. And the water is really just melted. Huh? So it's, it's melted and the water stays inside. And now it stays unfrozen for a time. And this is the time when the scientists come with their equipment. So they're boxed up. And here you can see the photomultiplier. So the, the sensitive cameras, we attach them on long cables, which we call strings, which you will see in a second. So we attach it on this cable. This cable brings power, so the high voltage to this optical modules. And of course, they are associated electronics, so we can capture the signals. And then they go down and eventually uh, sent down very far and then refreeze. So once this is all built, you can see this is an array, now one cubic kilometer. All these little um, dots on these strings would be these optical modules. And here you can see a muon that will come again, which is very high energetic, which will travel through the whole detector. And then you can see di the different sensors light up as the muon goes through. Yeah? So by the arrival time of the photons, and also the size of it means how much light they see, we can reconstruct the energy and also the direction, as I said, of these particles. This is how we essentially do particle physics with these. So I wanna, so the holy grail of essentially coming back to observing neutrinos now from these objects, what like, let's say uh, here we have a, um, uh, what we call a blazar. A blazar is actually a supermassive black hole which accretes a lot of matter and then sends out these jets, which you can see again here like blasts of charged particles, which can create neutrinos, which can create photons, high energetic photons and whatnot. And this is exactly what we wanna, uh, what we wanna observe. And the holy grail of this observation is essentially what we call a multi-wavelength observation, where you would at the same time from, let's say a temporary burst of this object, detect neutrinos, detect photons, high energetic photons, for example, with satellites or also ground-based instrumentation, or also if you wanna go there, this will be of course extremely exciting gravitational waves, uh, which is something which we were able in particle physics reason, let's say within the last few years only to detect. So here's for example, how IceCube sends uh, the most interesting high energetic events over a few years. So you see they pop up here and now and then and IceCube sends alerts out to the astronomy community to like, hey, let's look at this. Maybe there is something interesting. Do you find something counterpart of high energetic photons or for example, as I said, um, uh, gravitational waves or something else. So here we saw, IceCube saw one of these pairs. This would be this X here in the middle with a lot of neutrinos centered exactly around this. This is the neutrinos they saw. And this was the first multi-messenger observation of a neutrino and high energy gamma rays from this, what is now colloquially called Texas source. So what you see actually here, these color images are actually the high energetic photons. And then only these boxes are the super high energy neutrinos, which were seen exactly at the same time as these photons. So this is one observation, which is highly interesting because it starts or allows you to start to understand what is going on in these sources. Of course, one event is not enough. And this is exactly why we will come back to BC in a second. So if I just show you here the history a little bit of neutrino telescopes, they conceptually were introduced in the 1960s. Yeah. So then it was envisioned that you could do that in ice around the 90s, let's say. Amanda was a pre predecessor of IceCube at the South Pole, was completed in 2000, it could 
do first science with them. Like, expect, uh, for example, you can also um, get neutrinos from the atmosphere. In 2011, IceCube was completed, the full detector. The first diffuse, what we call, so first hints that there are very high energetic neutrinos, which don't come out from the atmosphere, were found in 2013, but only in 2018, they found this event, which I just showed you. So it's the first source which was identified. So essentially, if we take this from the completion of IceCube, we had to wait it's on the order of 10 years to get one or two, or let's call it a handful eventually even of these events. And that of course is not enough to do neutrino astronomy, despite that we know it is there. And that's why you can ask the question, can we also go neutrino fishing somewhere else than just at the South Pole? And maybe can we do this in the ocean? And why not, if we can do it in the ocean, can do it right in front of our neighbor or in our, in our neighborhood here? And it turns out we have right here in BC um, something very unique, which is Ocean Networks Canada. So it's one of the deepest and also the largest and most advanced cabled ocean observatories, which of course generally focus on marine biology, oceanography, and not on particle physics. But of course, this makes it very interesting because maybe we can tap into this and actually do in a kind of a symbiosis particle physics with Ocean Networks Canada. So just for the location here, of course, is Vancouver. And here we have Vancouver Island. And essentially you can see this very large cabled network, which spans out here a few hundred kilometers out into the ocean. And the site we are interested in is the so-called Cascadia Basin site, which is roughly the same depth in water, what ice cube is deep at the South Pole, roughly three kilometers. So we investigated if we can do that, and I will go through this maybe a little bit uh, faster, um, so the first thing is, of course, can you build a neutrino telescope there, which is where you need to understand are the optical properties of the water, is this good enough to actually do particle physics? Like, is the water clear enough? Do we have too much bioluminescence? So animals down there, which emit light, you know, do we have, have too much sedimentation or maybe are the currents too wild? You know? Like, can you actually do this? So what we deployed, is two mini strings, let's call it. Uh, these two strings, they're only 100, a good 100, 150 meters high, and they're instrumented with some um, light detection equipment and also some light emitting equipment, so flashing. So we can essentially flash with some LEDs and lights and kind of almost lasers if you want so, and then detect that light, which we flash from one side and see and study the optical properties. Here you can see some pictures of um, essentially ONC at work of the equipment we have established. And here you can see one of the ROVs at the at almost three kilometer depth where it essentially anchors on the ground, these strings. So one crucial thing, which was the first thing to test, which might not come to mind to people very easily is how operational can the detector actually be? And this is of course a question how good is ONC to be always operational, provide power, be able to get the data out of there so we can operate our detector literally 24 seven. And that is crucial because we never know when interesting events happen in the universe. You never know, unfortunately, nobody tells us beforehand. So you wanna be close to 100% uptime. So you really make sure you don't miss anything. So this is excellent. IceCube is actually a little bit better because they have, um, uh, established this for a long time, but almost 99% of the time, you know, we can be operational, which is very important. One thing which I will not drag out too much right now, but just for the people who are a bit more interested in also how we do this, we measure the optical properties, as I said. So essentially by optical properties, you can think of how fast get if I emit light. So let's say I emit light from one source up here. So one string. So I emit light here, and you can see these uh, kind of red rays or arrows here symbolize the light. I try to detect it here with these sensors here. And how fast does the water absorb the photons or the light as I try to emit it? Uh, so if the water quality is very poor, I will of course not detect very much here. If the water quality is very good for us, 
then I can, at a very large distance, still see a lot of the light I emitted up here. And this is exactly why we did this. Uh, so I will maybe skip that plot here on the right, but this is something where we measured how good the optical qualities are. We call it the attenuation length. And here you can see it over the wavelength spectrum. So we measured this for various wavelengths and it is indeed very good. And it's uh, absolutely suitable to build a neutrino telescope. Then. Okay, so essentially what I want to show you now as well. So we have found for the physics part, yes, we can optically qualify the site and we could really build a neutrino detector there. But also what you can do, which I think is quite neat and very interesting and has not been looked into so much, you can have quite some handle on some interdisciplinarity. So you can do oceanography, microbiology, and also climate change related studies because we essentially build a humongous array of sensors, which generally marine biologists can't afford or don't build in the same way. So what you see here is, for example, a few seconds long image of one of these um, pyrosomes, we call them down there, which emits light. Uh, so these organisms, and we can really study them. So I wanna show you this because this is really quite neat. So what you see here is essentially when these pyrosomes or organisms, when they go through the water column, they don't do anything. But if they get disturbed, and the disturbance here would be one of our optical modules, which are these little black dots you see here. So if they get disturbed, they start to emit photons, they get agitated. Uh, so what you see here is the light or photons, which are emitted over some times and seconds. So this is a simulation. Um, so when the spikes, you see obviously these red little pyrosomes, they are unhappy and they emit light. Uh, so we put instruments down there, which can measure exactly this light. So this is only a qualitative, what I show you right now, but we of course a careful study. And what you can really see is this is the light we detect in these kind of sensors over time again here for different wavelength of photons or light, again, in the same way. So you really can start to study the species of these organisms which are down there. You can study this over time. You can study this over column depth, over temperature, you know? So it's, it's really a lot of interest is from the oceanography and also marine biology um, group on this kind of experiment, which for us, of course, for particle physicists is just an add-on in this moment. Okay, so only two or three more slides and then I will, so I will wrap up. So P1, so the Pacific Ocean Neutrino Experiment, the next steps, so we actually can get a neutrino observatory down there. So what we are building right now and hope to deploy it next year is the first proper prototype line. So of course, time didn't stand still, things have evolved. Maybe for the careful eye, you saw IceCube had one large, what we call photomultiplier tube. So kind of, this is a photomultiplier tube, had only one large photomultiplier tube with associated electronics. Um, now we have all understood that essentially you can, almost like your camera, it got more and more pixelated. So if you make more smaller of these light sensitive detectors, you actually can reconstruct or you can understand the light which is emitted much better and much more precisely. Uh, we've also learned of course about certain calibration devices. And of course we want to incorporate all of this into this first mooring line, which will serve as the blueprint for the detector we want to build. So these lines, this is just a little image here, they will be on the order of one kilometer long, similar to IceCube, and will house um, 16 to 20 or 20 of these um, optical modules, which you can see kind of a, a, a breakup chart um, shown here. In addition, we constantly want to understand uh, the water down there and calibrate our detector so we can get the most precise data. This is especially important for particle physics. So we will, on some of these spots, we will put these kind of calibration devices, which are actually the ones we will build in our lab here at SFU. So we will develop and build them. So essentially they look more or less the same. So you still have these what we call PMTs, so these sensitive elements, but then on each end, you have these very bright, light emitting spheres. Uh, so they kind of your standard candles to light up and you can then detect the light from these in a controlled fashion at certain distances and understand. 
So from this prototype line, which we will deploy next year, the next step, which we are currently working on, and which we hope to also more or less continuously move over in the range from, let's say, optimistic year 23 to 26, would be a first real detector stage where we have 10 of these mooring lines bundled together. So one kilometer in height. And you can see here sort of on the area of um, a radius of 200 meters. Um, and then, of course, this will it takes a little bit longer. If, if we are very successful with this, we would come in the end to the experiment stage, which will then be larger in size than currently IceCube is. Um, so this is just a, a rendering, an idea in the moment. Uh, potentially it will look different, but you can have these clusters of these units we are aiming to build in the next few years, essentially clustered around here. And eventually you have detector, which is now larger in size than ice cube, like a few cubic kilometers. Okay, so the grand plan, as I told you, ice cube has done amazing. It's a fantastic experiment, but it is very limited by the number of neutrinos it can detect. And in order to really start this field of neutrino astronomy, which is exciting, which is completely uncovered, uh, is you need more exposure. You need more exposure and you need more of these telescopes. And especially IceCube is not able, and I will show you this on the next slide, which is a little bit of a finicky detail, but is not able to really well look into our own galaxy. And of course, we also have a black hole in the center of our galaxy. So you would expect to learn very interesting things directly from our own galaxy. So here you see essentially uh, the proposed P1 ice cube. And then there are two other detectors, one in here in, in Lake Baikal and one in the Mediterranean. Both of these are also in construction stage a little bit further, but they also have their own independent issues. But hopefully, eventually, we will be operating this as one global neutrino observatory. And this is the last kind of point I wanted to drive home. So here, what you see is essentially, if you would have each of the detectors, what I just mentioned, they could cover the most sensitive range for these ultra high energy neutrinos, where you can do really the best is around a sliver around the horizon. This is where you are the best with each of these neutrino telescopes. And you can see if IceCube has this kind of band here, where the galactic center is right here. Yeah? So the galactic center is never in the field of view of IceCube. And IceCube has a very hard time. So obviously, you can't move IceCube somewhere else. But the other locations, all of the other ones, the, it always has a field of view where you can look into the galactic center, and which is, of course, very interesting. Yeah? So all the other experiments here on the northern hemisphere will really boost the exposure for our own galaxy, which is the nearest source potentially of these very interesting neutrino sources. Okay, so I hope when I just put that back into your mind, I could somewhat convince you or tell you what a neutrino is, that it's special and also how we can detect them. So this is the high energy part. There are also other ways to detect neutrinos. But this is basically if you want to detect high energy neutrinos and also why it is interesting. And also, I mean, this why is more or less a big part is Ocean Networks Canada, which happens to be right here in BC, which is really an opportunistic way for us particle physicists to maybe merge and work together with them. So with this, I will end here. And neutrino astronomy is really something that has started in the last few years started purely by IceCube. Um, we often call, and I hope I can convince you a little bit, that neutrinos are the high energy messenger of the universe. And also when you're interested, like myself, even more into the particle physics aspect than into, let's say, studying astronomy or astron astronomical objects, there's so much particle physics at these high energies. And we on Earth can't do as well as the universe by itself, nature can do. And more or less deliver us for free these particles. But in order to do this, we need to study more neutrinos and really understand what this messenger is telling to us and why not do it here in BC because we have an opportunistic opportunity. And the last thing I wanna say, and this is really in the last, I would say since the 1960s or even before, 
Neutrinos have surprised us over and over again. They're never boring. So we will for sure find something very interesting and very unexpected when we look for them. Thank you very much. And sorry for being maybe five minutes, a bit too many. All right, thank you so much. That was a very insightful uh, presentation, Matthias. We appreciate your presentation today. That was uh, loaded with so much information and we did learn so much, I did at least. So now I invite our audience to type in your questions on the uh, Q&A box. We have received quite a number and I will read through the questions in the order that we receive them. So Matthias, I'll start with the first question that came in. Yep. If neutrinos interact very weakly or not weak interaction, then how can we extract information from them? The only information basically would be from the source of the neutrino. Exactly. So um, this is exactly more or less the point. So we, the ideal messenger, you know, when you can think of this, I mean, you can take any analogy, uh, even in everyday's world, the ideal messenger, um, just imagine your, uh, you post a letter and the letter gets changed by the messenger on the way. So the information you receive on the other end has a changed information in the letter. Uh, so we, of course, don't want that. So it is exactly the perfect scenario. So the neutrino gets emitted at the source. So we can understand exactly what happened at the source if we can detect these neutrinos, the energy. I didn't talk about neutrinos come actually in flavor, so different types. So we can understand if we would look at the flavors of this. So this is a bit more particular, but nothing gets alternated as it comes to us. So the challenge of course is because they don't interact at all or more or less you know, very, very weakly and never want to interact, you have to build these huge detectors to actually be able to detect them. And you have to wait for quite a while. And even then you only get a handful of events. And if you wanna do neutrino astronomy or real studies, you need more. And that's why we need to build also more and bigger detectors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a follow-up question to that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess this person was trying to rephrase the question, how much new information can we get from them about the source? So this is a very, um, it is a good question. Let me actually close that window here because, um, so this is a very good question. It's um, not easily quickly answered, but um, it is very important. So basically what I told you, this picture of, um, of I guess I'm not sharing anymore. Huh? So the sharing has been stopped, but that's okay. I can just talk. So um, the way particles get accelerated in magnetic fields, this picture, that we have particles which accelerate in these large magnetic fields, how these magnetic fields are created, that all of this is powered by gravitational energy when stars collapse or when essentially you have mass accreting on this black hole, which is emitted, is just some hypothesis. Nobody knows that. Um, so this is the working hypothesis. And this is something one still has to show. Um, so nobody could show this. And you cannot prove this or cannot show this alone with photons. So therefore you need the combined observation of photons and neutrinos. So that's just a short, short answer maybe. Right, right. Moving on to the next question, will the uh, one kilometer lines in the ocean tangle up marine life? So that's a good question. They will not generally tangle up marine life. It's very deep. Yeah. So you actually, I don't think I have the picture. But um, these pyrosomes, these organisms, they can actually tangle sometimes around them. But mm -hmm. uh, um, no, this is uh, not a worry. It has also been done before. Um, so it okay. will not um, tangle up marine life. They're also, in principle, um, they're spaced 50 to 100 meters apart. So it's not that this is like a fishing net. They are easily uh, navigatable for even the largest animals. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe the question is also, do they tangle themselves? That's also a good question. Right. But um, the currents are very uniform. So you have to imagine the ocean current um, as something extremely uniform, which changes, of course, with the tides. But it's not that 
you have streams which go down there um, completely like we are used to on the surface. So it really changes like this. So these lines do move, they mm -hmm. move a few meters. And this is important for us to understand and we have to monitor this, but they can't move like crosswise that they would tangle. Like if you would think in a turbulent right. way. Right. And maybe just to add one fun fact, because always people maybe don't know that, the South Pole moves as well. So glacial mm -hmm. ice, as we all know, moves, yeah? but people mm -hmm. don't, um, don't realize that. So the South Pole moves by 10 meters a year. So um, Ice Cube actually moves as well by 10 meters a year. It moves very coherently, but not quite. So the ice at the bottom moves a little bit faster. So over mm -hmm. time, essentially you get Ice Cube is doing something like this. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Next question is, what is the practical use of detecting neutrinos in our world today? If we could detect them easily, what does that mean? And will this be a new form of energy for powering our world? So first of all, what it is, I mean, that is, um, one has to always say, it's fundamental research, it's fundamental science. Mm -hmm. um, so we are really knowledge driven. And maybe as a, as a byproduct out of knowledge driven science, we of course develop a lot of new technology because we try to find solutions to make these detectors happening. Uh, there are many examples. I don't wanna give the most obvious ones, but by pushing the boundaries on these kind of technologies, for example, maybe to give you one technologies we use to, to emit these bursts of light to be detected then, so we use them as calibration is also what we um, generally know as LIDAR, so kind of a light radar. And these LIDAR technologies are essentially what makes self-driving cars self-driving these days, because that's what their eyes are to see. Yeah? Yeah. So developments, what we can push in LIDAR detection, for example, can be in many other fields, which we are in our everyday world, can be used as you know, advantages or as, as pushing the boundaries in this direction. It will not be a form of new energy or anything of that. So you will not have that. People also um, sometimes said it was the ideal messenger because you could send the information directly through the earth. But of course, again, you right. have the problem to detect it, which it's not gonna be. Um, the one thing which people really have thought about is, and, uh, and this is what you can do with neutrinos, as neutrinos are traces of nuclear reactors, and actually that's what they're also used for research, you could see if uh, nuclear reactors go online in certain areas or not. And this was something which especially the Department of Energy in the US was quite interested at some point mm -hmm. to have detectors like this more of a military use to be able essentially to track nuclear reactions, which could also turn, of course, to, to non-civil use, but, right. but, but not really. So right. it's fundamental science and spin-off is something of technologies we develop. I would say that is um, the, the most. Um... Right. I'll move on to the next. It's an interesting comment and question. First of all, thanks for the uh, interesting talk. You mentioned early on that neutrinos interact with something to create moons. What is this? And I thought that neutrinos did not interact with anything. Sorry, maybe I need to read it as well. I don't know what the- You mentioned earlier that neutrinos interact with something to create moon. Uh, muons. 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 <laughs> Sorry, that might- yeah. No, no, that, that, no, that, that, no, no, muons, is, is he, it's, uh, it's completely uh, correctly written. So, um, so, so neutrinos do interact, otherwise we would not be able to, to uh, detect mm -hmm. them. Uh, the point is that they really don't like to interact. So. Um, we call this very, um, it's also the type of interaction, but they're very weakly interacting. So they do interact and when they interact, they interact essentially with the atoms or with the, or with, with, with part of the, the atom, you know, of the particles. So in this interaction, we, um, you can create um, either an electron, a muon or a tauon. So all of these are leptons. Uh, so the electron is what we are used to and if you're a particle physicist or have learned a little bit more in particle physics, then you know you have a kind of two other cousins of the electron, which is the muon or the tau lepton as well. Mm -hmm. And exactly in the same flavor, the neutrinos come. So they're, they have kind of little flags on them. And there's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And the ones 
which create the muons is if a muon neutrino interacts in the ice, so with the nucleus in there. And then in this interaction, essentially, it completely breaks up mm -hmm. and it creates this muon, which is very high energetic and flies out. And this muon is exactly what we see. The neutrino itself, you can never in, uh, see in these detectors. We only see the product of the interaction of the neutrino and then the muon is flying through the detector and emits the light. And that is what we can detect. We can do the same with the electrons and also with the tauons, but they look a bit different when they interact with the detector. So the signature is different. Interesting. Next question, is there an anti-neutrino? Yes. So you have the electron, you have the positron, you have a neutrino and you have an anti-neutrino. So you have the antiparticles as well. Nice. Uh, we have someone who wants you to expand on the interaction of the neutrino when it produces. Is the neutrino slowed? Which question yes, is that? Maybe I can expand read. on the interaction of the neutrino when it produces. Is the neutrino is the neutrino slowed? Slowed. So okay. So um, it is essentially. Um, so we call this particle physics. A, it's a very technical term, a deep inelastic scatter, uh, scattering or, or interaction. So essentially it's a complete disastrous interaction. The neutrino interacts and it is destroyed. It doesn't exist afterwards anymore. Um, so um, the neutrino interacts, it exchanges some other particles and there's no direct neutrino of this flying out. So you have, of course, remnants of this interaction. You can almost think of it as a quite violent interaction in terms of particle physics world. So lots of particles are flying out, but the neutrino is gone and most of the energy and the momentum of this neutrino is put into the corresponding lepton, which the lepton is this muon or electron. And that's why, so everything essentially is transferred to this muon and that flies out. And that is very important because if this muon wouldn't travel, so if it comes in the neutrino and the muon wouldn't travel in the same direction, we could never do astronomy with this because we mm -hmm. would never know where the neutrino came from. Uh, so if this would fly everywhere out, you, you, you get a neutrino detector, but you can't do astronomy with it. So only the fact that essentially everything is more or less transferred to this muon, that allows us to do neutrino astronomy. I'll read the next two questions coming from the same person. Mm -hmm. Will we get hurt if neutrinos hit us? And her second question is, if neutrinos have energy, couldn't we eat them? <laughs> no, so, so um, the, the second one, I don't know how to answer because you <laughs> cannot eat them. Um, or I don't have a very good answer to that one, but um, no, so neutrinos stream through us like, a, uh, millions of neutrinos stream through you wherever you are every second. Uh, as I said, you even emit them. Uh, mm -hmm. But because they don't interact, they don't leave any. So if there is an interaction, they would lose, they would interact and probably deposit energy, you know. But because they literally don't interact, they just stream through you freely and you will absolutely don't know that they exist okay. and go so through. So we will you. not get hurt. All right. What makes ice or water suitable for observing neutrinos? That's a very good question. There's also many other sort of, um, let's say material which makes them suitable. Actually in principle in particle physics, it's always the heavier and denser you go, the better chance you have that these particles will interact. I mean, you probably know this from how to shield you from nuclear reactors. You know, we put lead or, or a lot of concrete around us, you know. So in principle, that would be also great. And you probably have a bit more effective detector. But the problem is that the technology, how I explained it, we need these, when these muons are created, they travel through the detector and the detector is the medium itself. So we can't build something that huge. Huh? So we essentially, instead of building something that huge, we just drill some holes into the ice and put the detector in this. And then you essentially build your detector within the natural environment of the ice or the water. Yeah? And it has to be transparent because of course, if I have concrete or lead, the photons which are emitted from this, the light could not be detected in my little cameras, which I put in the ice or in the water. Um, so I can only 
I need a transparent medium where these photons or light can travel around. And then it needs to be kind of natural and large. Huh? So mm -hmm. there are other detectors as well. As I said, and they're, let's say, try to go a little bit onto the lower energy neutrinos. And you can use different types of technology or medium as well. But essentially, the key for this technology is that you need something transparent, very large. Mm -hmm. So you go to something natural that would be a lake or the ocean or a large frozen body of water, which is ice. Right, ice. Hmm. Do neutrinos lose energy when they interact with water? Yes, so there are different types of interaction. The one I was talking, which actually we observed, as I said before, as I answered before, it gets, it transfers all the energy when it interacts. I see. There mm -hmm. are also what we call actual scattering events, which you can almost think of it as a, a pool table. Mm -hmm. um, so that is also an interaction we can potentially see. And mm -hmm. there the neutrino survives and scatters off. So let's say bounces off if you want a very um, similar mm -hmm. analogy. And um, particles are still created, which we can detect, but it's not quite the same. So we are really looking into this kind of almost destruction of the neutrino type event. Right. Next question is, can we use dense objects to force neutrinos to interact? For example, Bose-Einstein condensate. So I'll just um, say quickly because my, my family is coming back now. So um, <laughs> there might be some, some, some background noise um, appearing soon and me That's answering okay. the questions. Um, so let me think of, I, I don't have a um, excellent answer whether this would enhance somehow the neutrino cross-section in any form, which is the uh, physical term for, for what you need for the interaction. Um, as I said, dense objects, yes. Um, but uh, you, I, I honestly don't have a good answer right now if um, okay. how the cross section in such a, um, in such a special, very, very special kind of um, uh, condensate would look right right now. I, I never thought about that. Right, I'll move on to the next. Um, since neutrinos can go through anything, why can't the South Polar Observatory observe neutrinos from all directions? Is it because neutrinos traveling through the core of the Earth might be affected in some way before being observed at the polar detectors? That's a very, very good uh, question. So um, the neutrino, um, so, so the cross section, again, I use this term, so the, 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 the chance of the neutrino interacting with the material increases the more energetic they are, which is actually very unusual for particles. Normally this goes lower. So in generally, if particles have more energy, they actually like to uh, interact less. But neutrinos are different. They actually like to interact more. So if you have very, very high energy neutrinos, the ones we are really the most interested from these, um, let's say, astrophysical phenomena, the Earth essentially provides a shield for these high energy neutrinos. Uh, so the probability that this neutrino interacts, despite that the, the cross section, this chance of interaction is so low, there's so much material throughout the earth that eventually you get a probability it will interact. Um, so it's almost 100%. And that's why at some point, the highest energy neutrinos, you have to look either that they come down or you look, let's say, around the horizon when you don't have much of material or like mm -hmm. earth to traverse, um, which is something people didn't think of because the traditional way how ice cube was built is exactly to do that, to look through the earth because no other particle can go through the earth, only neutrinos can. And so, but this only works to a certain amount of energy. And it was later understood that, hey, actually the ones which are the most interesting ones we actually can't get them. So it's kind of both ways work. Right. So I'm, I'm going to pick up the last three questions on the okay. list. I'm not sure if I'm going to read this correctly. What does it mean when some like Opera say 
neutrinos break the speed of light limit? Yep. So this was an experiment um, which uh, claimed at some point a few years back that neutrinos uh, travel faster than the speed of light. And uh, this is not true. And they found a mistake in the experiment and um, neutrinos do not travel faster than the speed of light. Right. They also cannot because they have a little tiny mass. So they cannot be faster than the speed of light. Maybe right. I can clarify one thing because I made that comment before and people, oh, it trips sometimes people when I said um, the muon travels in the ice faster than the speed of light. And that is possible, but only faster than the speed of light in the medium. You cannot travel faster than the speed of light in vacuum, but within water, the speed of light is slower than in, in vacuum. And then highly charged particles can actually travel faster. And only when they do, then they emit this characteristic light, which was like a supersonic airplane, which helps us to identify mm -hmm. or to be able to reconstruct these particles. Next question is, what if a station at the North or South Pole drills past the ice and into the sea and scientists don't know? Okay, so, I mean, you, you can't. So there is, a, there is a rock at the bottom and there's three kilometers of ice and uh, we melt and there's nothing to drill into. So if you would um, hit the rock, then you would melt down to the rock. So, yeah. Right. And this question is interesting. How bright are Cherenkov rad radiation from neutrinos? That's a very good question. So as I said, um, you, for example, if you, if you could sit down there at Ice Cube, let's say you have a little observation cabin in almost three kilometers depth, um, and one of these muons would fly through, you would not see this with your naked eye. So the amount of light which is created is not enough. But as I also said, when you have many, many, many of these um, charged particles flying around, many of them creating this Cherenkov light, then we can see it. And this is exactly the reason why these nuclear reactors glim blue. So it's not because they're full of water or people paint the, the, the walls blue. It's because of this characteristic Cherenkov light, which actually peaks in the blue light in the emission. And that's why everything looks blue and not white or red or so. Uh, so you can see this by naked eye, but only in something like a nuclear reactor because there's really a lot of charged particles flying around and all of them create a lot of these photons and then we can see it. But if you take one of these, you need special uh, detectors like we put in the ice in order to pick up these photons. So our, right. our naked eye would not be able to see that. Right. Thank you. I'll end with this last question. We have a question from a high school student in the room yep. asking what inspired you into studying neutrinos? That's a very good question. Um, I, I don't know if I have an inspirational answer, but maybe the, the correct answer is when I was studying this um, many, many years back now in, in Munich, um, I was essentially in a class about so a, a big class about neutrino physics and um, um, we had to pick a topic for uh, essentially a talk like a seminar we had to prepare and give and um, along this long list of topics some of them I decided at the time you know oh this is all too complicated I don't want to deal with this and then there was neutrino telescopes and I thought, okay, telescope sounds easy enough. You know, I, I take some light, some, some light dishes as I'm used to. I take a light observation. I can talk about neutrino telescopes a little bit. Um, turns out that neutrino telescopes absolutely don't work like the standard telescopes I had in mind. And I started to get intrigued. And by that, um, I would say my whole journey to, to even go to New Zealand, because I was already at that point interested to, to essentially work with Ice Cube, get closer to the South Pole, make my way sort of this direction, um, started it. So maybe not the most inspirational one, it's more like of a, um, which seemed at the time the easiest topic to pick, the topic of least <laughs> resistance, but um, it's the honest answer. And um, I got so intrigued when I learned what that is, 
that I continued down that path. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. And I hope that inspired particularly not just the high school student who asked that question, but everyone else in, in the room. I did learn a lot and thank you so much for that presentation. And I'd like to thank all of you who joined us today and all the questions you've typed in your Q&A box. We appreciate your engaging with us and we do hope you could join us again. And I'd also like to thank Matthias for being with us tonight. I know it, we had a quite a rough start with all the technical difficulties, but I'm so happy that we all that got resolved. Thank you so much. And I'd like to take this time to thank, I have a couple of SFE colleagues working at the back end. You don't see them, but they are, I call them my superheroes for today. Thank you so much for helping me and uh, with all the uh, back end tech support for this webinar. I appreciate your being with us today as well. I hope you can all join us for our next discussion, still on astronomy, but this time from a a faculty member from our Department of Statistics to talk about astrostatistics and alien Earths. That's happening on Saturday. Please save the date, Saturday, May 7th, 4 o'clock, still virtually. And because you had registered for this event, you will receive on your emails um, more information about this next event. I hope you can join us on May 7th. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Matthias. And I hope to see thank you, you for all. Thank you having me. Thank you so much. I, I hope to see you all for the next discussion. In the meantime, have a great rest of your evening. Take care, everyone.